God's going to do like Lucy going to do some splaining. Luke 21. The message is entitled, The Church Shall Prevail. I love that because Jesus gives us his word in Matthew 16. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church that he has built and is building and will continue to build until the work on this earth is completed by the church. The church has gone through so many things throughout the centuries, persecution, martyrdom. A lot of evil men have risen up to try to destroy and eradicate the church, but the church, as much as the enemy hates us and hates what God is doing through us, the church grows and thrives. The more the church underground in China is afflicted, the stronger and the greater in number that they grow. Because God has said, no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper. And so, Jesus said, when the shepherd is scattered, I mean, when the shepherd is killed, the sheep are scattered. And when Jesus was on the cross, I want you to think about this as we get ready to read God's word. Jesus moved cities. He stirred up regions. He was no small evangelist. When Rome, the greatest empire at Jesus' day, was distraught and worried about Jesus and the authority that he was gaining through his notoriety of miracles, signs, and wonders, and the great words that he spoke, it shook them to the core. And they felt threatened by his presence in his speech the Jews that looked at Jesus and understood how the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees operated they said he spoke as one having authority not like the others when he spoke things happened kingdoms shook demons trembled and came out of people dead people were raised so whenever he moved everything moved around him he was not that defeated, broken down person of a man that Hollywood has tried to depict him sometimes. He was great. He walked in authority. He shook the things up in his day. And I want you to think about the hope that he brought to the disciples and those that believed in his message that if you believe on him, you shall not die, but you shall have everlasting life. And then he gets on the cross and he gives up the ghost. Can you imagine the somberness that filled the atmosphere in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Israel? Can you imagine that, y'all? How foreboding it may have seemed the... As soon as he gave up the ghost, it says that there was an earthquake and the rocks were torn and the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. And all of this, and it got real dark. And it was, it was like, what is going on? Can you imagine the sadness and the despair that was in the disciples and those that believed in Jesus in the heart. And it was as though that Jesus in the day that he was giving us our victory over death, hell, and the grave. Seemed like the darkest day in history. You got to be careful when you're looking at the natural and you think that it's over. When that could be the very day that God is about to show up and do something that you did not uh, expect because we walk by faith and not by sight we've got to get that in our spirit and so as I was thinking about this message and letting God just pour into me what he wanted me to tell you all see when you don't know what God is doing and you don't really hear what he's saying because you've got all this noise this chatter from the world and then you got your own mind your emotions and your thoughts that are coming against you with negativity because you're hearing so much and you're seeing so much despair you're seeing so much death and, and problems going on and evil rising up and it's like God please help us and God says I'm, I'm bringing a sure word and with this word faith will come and it can give you strength to overcome Come the evil that's coming against your heart and mind trying to talk you into giving up. 
And so I, as I was thinking about this, the Lord reminded me of the walls of Jericho. Walls so thick they had chariots racing around the top. And God says, those walls are going to come down. Tells Joshua, you know Joshua. He wasn't that great man of God that Moses was. He didn't lift the rod and water was parted and they walked through the sea. This was just Joshua, young Joshua that, that walked with Moses. Moses is dead now. It's a very somber time in Israel. And God speaks to Joshua and says, I want you to take these people over the river Jordan and I'm going to give them their inheritance, the promised land. And he tells them how to take down Jericho. He says, you're just going to march around at one time for six days. And then on the seventh day, here's what I want you to do. I want you to march around at seven times. But while you're marching around, I want you to be quiet. No dogs wagging their tails, no tongues wagging, nobody talking. I want it silent. And Jesus died on the cross, and everything went silent. Did you know when, I think it's either the seventh plague is opened or the seventh vial is poured out in Revelation, there's silence in heaven. Isn't that interesting when God's about to do the greatest thing on the earth? Everything goes silent. You know why? See, things are getting real silent in the church. There's not a whole lot of shaking, not a whole lot of moving, not a whole lot of excitement because of all the death and all the stuff that's coming, all the, the threats of nuclear war over in Europe. And everything's growing quiet. And you say, has God lost control? Are the demons running the insane asylum? What's going on? The Lord spoke to me. He says, no flesh is going to grow in glory in my presence. Jesus had to die in the flesh to give us victory in the spirit. The Jews could not talk around the seven times going around Jerusalem because no flesh was going to get the glory. There could be no sound. Now, wait a minute. If they had, if they was talking up a storm, see, scientists now have figured out what caused the walls to fall. See, every, every sound has a frequency. And everything that is built, a frequency. You ever heard somebody that could sing opera? And they could sing so loudly, it could break a champagne glass? Because that, that octave is high enough to reach the molecular structure of that glass and that frequency hits it and it disintegrates it. And so God says, I don't want one person speaking because no flesh is going to get the glory for this. Scientists have realized it was the, the, the rhythm of their walking around that caused a certain frequency that broke down the, the molecular structure of those walls. And it was them obeying God walking around that caused the, the walls to fall down. And if they had been talking, they said it was our voices. And God would not let flesh have the opportunity to get the glory for what God has done. And so God says, here's what I'm going to do in the last days. There's a lot of hype in the body of Christ. There's a lot of stars and idols going on. And I'm going to bring everything to naught. So in 2020, he flipped the switch. And he sent us a wake-up call, coronavirus, that shook the nations of the world. And every year since then, it has gotten darker and more difficult for the body of Christ. And what he's doing, he's bringing the high mountains down low. And he's bringing the low valleys up. And he's straightening out the crooked places. And he's putting everything in order so that when he says it's time, it's going to be time the body of Christ is going to come forth like a glorious bride and do the work of God. And no flesh is going to get glory in God's presence. See, we think it's over because we're listening to the wrong voices. God says, I haven't even cleared my throat. So don't get full of fear and despair because God is about to show the world who's boss. 
Luke 21, verse 20. That's a prophetic word for y'all. Jesus tells us about the, the days, the very days preceding his return to earth. And he says it's going to be very troublesome, does he not? But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, not just the armies, there are going to be armies of nations going to surround that little bitty place called Jerusalem over in the Middle East, then know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in where? Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be what? May be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress. There's great distress right now, is there not? Stress is just absolutely off the chart with people right now because of the great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon. And in the stars, we're seeing those things happening right now. And on earth, distress of nations and perplexity. Are we not being perplexed with all that's going on? We, we stopped having two genders. Now we got 40, 11 genders. Perplexity and complexity. The sea and the waves are roaring. And then he gets down to verse 26. Men's hearts failing them from fear, say fear. And the expectation of those things coming on the earth. Things are coming on the earth. They're coming wide open, are they not? For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. God is going to shake everything that can be shaken so that that which remains is of God. And you've got to be still while the shaking's going on lest you get shaken too. Then they will see, then they will see. After everything's been shaken, they will see the Son of Man. He didn't say the Son of God. He said the Son of who? The Son of Man, the firstborn among many brethren, coming in a cloud with what? Power and great glory. And they will look upon him whom they have crucified and pierced and declare he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Give him praise. When you, when you read or you hear scriptures like I just read about the end times, how does your mind and heart respond to it? You get a little sinking feeling about all the bad stuff that's going to happen. Can I get a witness? Because we don't really know what's going to, and how bad it's going to get. And it, it, it concerns us, does it not? It can cause us to have fear that there's going to be famines and pestilence and wars and rumors of wars that are going on. We say, my God, how are we going to be able to raise our family in all this tumultuous situations? But God is with us. Can I get a witness? In fact, the past two Sundays, the Lord has directed me to address the fear that has been hanging over us in the atmosphere of the Spirit. And people, by their own admission of raising their hands, have sensed the, that, that fear that was hanging out over us and, and have sensed it themselves. Also, he had me address the heaviness that is associated whenever you hear bad news and get reports of impending dangers. And so the Lord has been addressing these things that we're sensing and picking up on, both in the spirit and in the natural. Can I get a witness? Because he does not want to leave us forsaken to our own thinking. That's why you need to get in a good Holy Ghost field, believe the Bible for what it says, church, and get fed. And stay, starve your doubts to death. Jesus tells us that the pressure, the complexity from the events that will transpire in the days preceding his return to earth is going to cause men to stop because of fear. Stress off the charts. People having health issues because they're so stressed out because they cannot handle all the negativity that's going on, all the dangerous situations and all the adversity that people are facing. Can I get a witness? It's there, is it not? Since we know from Paul's letter to Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind, we know that fear is not from God, nor is it caused by God. Satan is trying to, he's going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And those that respond in fear, those are the ones he's going after. 
That's why God says, be still. Fear, as you know, is the result of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned and they heard the voice of the Lord God, they hid themselves because they were afraid. Sin places all people in bondage to fear because we dread punishment and we dread God's wrath. We covered that recently in a message. However, if you are born again, are you born again? If you're born again, you don't have to fear the wrath of man or the wrath of God because Scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, we are not appointed unto wrath but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Y'all should be shouting about that right now. We're not appointed under wrath. And I explained to you how that although Pharaoh wanted to pour out his wrath on the Jews and destroy them, God delivered them from the wrath of Pharaoh. Even though God want, uh, Pharaoh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to destroy the Jews, God delivered them from Nebuchadnezzar. Although Haman wanted to annihilate the Jews, God delivered them from the, the wrath. Even though sin was trying to destroy Nineveh, God called them and brought them to a place of repentance so they would not be destroyed by their own sin. But when you don't have uh, humility and you don't have repentance and you don't have that warning come, you are destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah without any hope. Can I get a witness that God is delivering us and will continue delivering us for both from the wrath of man and from his wrath because Jesus Christ has already paid the price for our sin debt. We are not appointed unto this stuff. They can go ahead and they can go ahead and make plans they can stay up all night and strategize in these think tanks and say we're going to destroy the church but God will say these men and these women these young men and these young women I have put my spirit of boldness in them they do not have the spirit of timidity and when you rise up against them they're going to rise up in the power and the might of my spirit and they will come against and I will be for them and the wrath of, of man will not be able to stand against my church that I have built because my strength is greater than your weakness God is able to do it and he's wanting to do it John chapter 20 verse 18 Jesus says Arisen, has not yet ascended to get his glorified body. Mary Magdalene comes to meet him at the tomb. In verse 18 it says, Mary came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and they had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, why were they shut there in that place? For fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were what? They were glad when they saw the Lord. They read up with fear until he showed up walking through the wall with the door shut. And then they got glad real quick. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So now he's wanting to what? Send them. Get them out of that room and send them to do what he called them to do. Can I get a witness? I came through this wall to tell y'all I'm alive. A body, a physical body could not walk through that wall, but I did. That's proven to you beyond any shadow of a doubt. I am the resurrected Christ, and now I'm sending you. Right? He gave them credible evidence that he was resurrected and that their trust that they had placed in him three days previously, that trust should still be intact, but it was not. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So that tells us at this point, while they're hiding out for fear of the Jews, they did not have the Spirit of God inside of them. But Jesus appears to them, breathes on them, and they all received the Holy Spirit. Notice the transformation that occurred in the hearts of the disciples when Jesus appeared before their eyes after his resurrection. Jesus, knowing that these men were paralyzed with fear, spoke peace over them. 
God sent me the, with this word because so many people are paralyzed with fear. Those that are watching, I don't know what nation you're in. I don't know what threat is coming against you. But I know the Spirit of God. There's people that are paralyzed today because of fear. But these disciples, when they saw Jesus, when they heard Jesus, the, the peace of God came upon them and they became glad in their hearts. Let me ask you this question. Did the Jews change their attitude toward the disciples because Jesus showed up? No. Did the circumstance that kept the, the disciples hidden out in that room, did the, did the circumstances change? No. What changed? Their perception. See, we can let worry and fear build up in us all week long because we don't come to church on Wednesday night. And we get here on Sunday and we just, we just wore out from the stress and we sit down and it's like, I need a word. And then you get that word that you know it was straight from God because you, your mail got read from, read from one side to the other and you left here encouraged and glad in your heart. They got encouraged. They got peace. This story from Scripture is a great illustration of how powerless, say powerless, it's how it shows us how powerless we can be against fear apart from the Lord. Shut up in a room, kind of like the church now on Sundays. The most segregated hour of the week. There's a, there's a very good reason why the disciples had no power over fear that gripped their hearts. Jesus said in the last days that men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of those things and the expectation of things that are going to come up on them. But the disciples had no power over that fear that gripped their hearts because of the hostility of the Jews and the threats that were made against them. The disciples didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. Therefore, they couldn't overcome fear in their own strength. How many church fellowships you reckon are joining today in the name of Jesus, but they really don't know the Jesus that they say they represent? And they give them traditions and doctrines of man, but not the truth because they do not want to offend. And the same people that walk in paralyzed by fear walk back out still paralyzed and unchanged by the fear that has them gripped. Wow. We cannot overcome. We're spirit, man. We're spirit, are we not? The spirit of God is in us, is it not? Except you have the spirit of Christ, you are not of him, the Bible says in Romans. We cannot overcome anything spiritual in our own strength. That's why the disciples were hiding out in fear. I'm belaboring that point to prove something even greater here in a moment. Before Jesus was crucified, he told the disciples what was going to happen to him. Did he not? At the hands of the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the chief priests of Israel. He told them exactly, they're going to crucify me. When Simon heard that Jesus was going to be crucified, he told the Lord that he would stop it from happening. Not going to happen, Lord. Yet, Simon Peter, boastful, bragging Simon Peter, he is there in that room just as stricken with fear as the other disciples are. Same one, hiding out. Where's all that boldness? Where's all the boldness of the evangelists, the, the fivefold minister that have written books about great things? Where is the boldness of the church today, y'all? Why are we hiding out in fear when we should be bold as lions? See, things have changed, and it's not the way it was. See, when everything was familiar and we had a good grip on everything and we could control and manipulate people, it was easy to have boldness. But when everything you try does not work on the people, then it's out of your control. And God says, I'm bringing everything that it's a man that was conceived in the heart of man, I'm bringing it to naught. And now ministers are wringing their hands and they're saying we can't control the people anymore. We can't get them to do what we want them to do anymore. And God says, I have shut their ears so they would not be moved by your rhetoric so that I could get them ready for what I'm about to do in the land. And I'm bringing the high places down. And those that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God, I am bringing them down. 
And so everything's being shaken. We don't like it. This brings up a powerful point. As humans, we may try to use our willpower to take on fear and face it. We use our willpower to attempt to overcome difficulties, habits, and problems. How many tried to fix something without really praying about it, and then after you figured out you couldn't fix it, you remembered you hadn't prayed yet? How many done that? Thank y'all for being honest. We all do it. We think everything's natural until we realize it's not. By then we figure it out. I should have prayed first. We let our, our willpower talk us in to going out and trying to whoop giants. And then after they wear us, slap out, we say, wait a minute. If I'd known this was a serious giant, I would have called on my big brother, Jesus. <laughs> However, as Christians, that's what we do as humans. We try to take on things with our willpower. I will it not to destroy me. I will myself to overcome this thing. I will fix this. But as Christians, the only thing that we can do with our willpower, y'all ready for this? Oh, this is a revelation that's going to set some people free. The only thing as Christians we can do with our willpower is to submit our will to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And when you really, truly, and sincerely submit your willpower, your will to the Lord, He will strengthen you by His Spirit and His grace to overcome the very things that our flesh couldn't overcome. So the things that seem impossible to us in the flesh, God says, when you church, bow down to me and submit your will to me in all these things, I will give you strength and my strength will come upon you. He said, I will bless you in Deuteronomy 28, did he not? And he said, because when I bless you, my favor and my power come upon you, nations shall fear you. That's what he said, did he not? And so we've got to submit ourselves in these days like we have never. And that's the hardest thing to teach Christians because I've been teaching it 21 years. <laughs> For those that weren't around 21 years ago, submission means that you don't agree with what's being told to you to do. There has to be a disagreement. And so when God tells you, obey, then you obey. But if God tells you to submit, that means you ain't listening. You ain't agreeing. And you're not going that way. And if God has to tell you to submit, that means there got to be some repentance. Change of mind and direction to agree with and conform to His will and not our will. Our Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we've got to learn how to submit as Christians. And then once we submit our will to his will, his grace and power will come upon us and we will have the ability to stop doing or to overcome what in our flesh we were unable to overcome. Right? Fear weakens our stand against sin and evil when we allow it to overtake our hearts. So Satan is trying his best to do everything that he can to stir up fear in our hearts. Because if he can intimidate us like Goliath speaking and taunting the armies of Israel, it weakened their stand. They were everyone afraid to step out and to face that giant. Goliath didn't want all the armies. He just wanted one man to face him off. And he says, whoever wins this battle, the victor, his people, will be the rulers of the loser and his people. So there was a lot at stake, but only one person could do it. And uh, all the military men that were there, arrayed in battle attire, none of them stepped out. And then David shows up. Something different about David. See, he was submitted to God. He trusted God. He trusted God to guide him, to teach him, and to empower him. Because he had a few battles in his life before this debut out here in the valley. The lion and the bear came and showed themselves strong. 
And God gave him victory over those things. And so that gave him confidence in God that God would deliver him from this giant. So he spoke up. He had both. But here's the point, y'all. Fear weakened every man on that battlefield. So we've got to guard our hearts from what? Fear. Because it weakens us as Christians. Therefore, we need revelation knowledge from God to expose both the root of fear and the power that fear has so we can overcome fear. See, we want to go out and overcome the giants in the land. Right? But God says you got a couple of things you got to overcome first. Like Joyce Meyer, that sink full of dirty dishes. When you get victory over those dishes, then we'll talk about nations, Joyce. But not until then. The devil is a liar. What do dishes have to do with the nations being saved, Lord? If you ain't faithful over those dishes, you can forget about me sharing my glory with you to give you glory and, and honor and authority over nations. Oh, it got real quiet right there, didn't it? Romans 5, I'll move right along real quick. Verse 1, y'all okay? Verse 1 says, therefore, having been what? Justified, made right in God's sight by faith, not by works, by faith. We have what? We have peace with God. So we don't have to be afraid of God, do we? Because in Christ, he has made us just in God's sight. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith, not through works. Lord, look, look at what I've done and what I've done should gain me access into your presence. No, it's by faith we gain access into this grace by which we what? Stand. Uh-oh. See, if you ain't standing, you don't need grace. You don't need grace to sin. And rejoice in hope. See, today we're rejoicing in hope of the glory of God because it looks like we don't have much hope in the natural and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. How many is learning how to glory in your tribulations? Count it all joy, James says, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. See, he's looking at the spiritual side of, of tribulation and persecution. He says in the spirit, it's going to gain perseverance in you, and perseverance will outlive your storm. You'll get that going home. And perseverance, character. Now we're going to start having character in the body of Christ. Still have a lack of integrity, we're going to have character. And character, now it produces hope. So if you had not learned how to persevere through submission to God, then you're not going to have character. If you don't have character, you're not going to have hope. And that's why you have a bunch of Christians with no hope. Now hope does not disappoint. See, when you hope in Christ Jesus, that hope is spiritual, it's eternal, because that hope is built in the character of who God is and the integrity of His Holy Word. Can I get a witness? Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been shed or poured out in our hearts. Where? In our hearts. Uh, hearts the, the hearts of men shall fail for fear of those things and the expectation of things coming on the earth. But the Holy Spirit is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, or the love of God, by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, showing us God's heart. He loves the ungodly. These verses break down all that Jesus has done for us to re reconcile us to the Father and also to restore our fellowship with God. When, Jesus, when the Lord God came in the garden, he says, Where are you, Adam? The fellowship between God and man was lost because of sin. Disconnect, correct? When Jesus died on the cross, he reconnected us to the Father, and our fellowship has been reconnected back to him. Now we have cell service in the Spirit with God because he's given us his Spirit. Nowhere do you see it in these verses we just read. Nowhere does Paul mention fear. As it pertains to us and the Father in these verses. Does it? It talks about peace. It talks about grace. It talks about endurance. It talks about character. It talks about hope. But it does not talk about fear. But he does mention the love of God. 
that it's given to us through the Spirit who dwells in us. Jesus breathed on the disciples and they were filled with the Spirit. So Jesus addressed the power when he was on the cross. He addressed the power and the consequences of sin through his death. And after his resurrection, after he had already dealt with sin, done away with it, atoned for our sin, and through that, we have access to forgiveness from the Father. But after his resurrection, Jesus addressed the issue of his father, uh, followers living in fear. Oh, I love that. But on, his, on the cross, he's dealing with sin. But after the cross, he's dealing with fear. Fear comes from sin. So once the sin is dealt with, Jesus got to come and renew our mind because we're used to the sin causing us to have fear. So today, Jesus, you know, you know, you know, we in America, y'all. And in most churches, they're going to preach evangelism today. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of that, thousands, if not tens of thousands, are going to be born again. Thank God for that. But they're going to keep preaching salvation every Sunday because that's what they're called. But then you're going to have Christians that are saved from sin, but they're still going to have fear because they haven't had their minds renewed through discipleship. And they're going to be sitting in those pews, eat up with fear. And when the government tells them to do something, what are they going to do? They're going to do what the government says. And when their giants tell them to do something, they're going to conform to the ways of this world because God, uh, the pastors are not teaching the sheep. Are you a disciple of Christ? I didn't ask you if you're born again of Christ. Are you a disciple? So after resurrection, Jesus comes, finds his disciples hiding out. Wait a minute. There's something vaguely familiar about the Lord God coming to man and him hiding out for fear. That was in Genesis 3. Now the Lord God comes and finds his disciples doing what? Hiding out for fear. But he says, boo, scares the devil out of them, gives them his peace, and he says, peace be still, and they were glad in their hearts. They said, oh, you're not going to destroy us because we denied you? You're actually giving us peace? And so, yeah, I would be fearful. I denied him. I lied on him. So when he came back and came through those I'd be like a white sheet. All my blood rushing down. I wonder if he's going to whoop me. And Jesus says, peace. Wow. See, that's the way a lot of Christians are. We live like this. Because we're afraid God's going to get mad at us and zap us. Zzz, zzz. No. He says, peace. This stuff that's going on in the world, that's not him. That's, that's Pharaoh being stirred up. That's the taskmasters being stirred up. Because they know their time is short, y'all. And God is saying today, peace be still. Have hope. Right? Now. So Jesus addresses the fear issue in the disciples' heart. The love of God <clears throat> is given to us by His Spirit, which dwells in every believer who is in Christ Jesus. So far, we have learned from Scripture two steps that will empower every Christian to overcome the flesh and to overcome fear so that we can obey God with boldness. Even when we're faced with hostility and threats, made against us you remember when Jezebel threatened Elijah's life he shut down he shut down his ministry he put up his tent he put all his equipment in the back of the trailer and he says I'm going he ran that's not what God wants us to do he wants us to have boldness in the face of threats and hostility and so he's teaching us first you got to submit right when you submit your will to the Lord, it's not your willpower getting you out of your hot water. It's God's grace, His power getting you out. And He will give us that strength to overcome self, 
Second, God has given his love to every child of God. So first, we learn how to submit to God our will and our willpower and trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not on our own understanding, and all our ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct our paths. And then he's teaching us that we have the Spirit of God, and through the Spirit of God, we have the love of God dwelling in our hearts. Oh, get ready. Through these two keys, we will be able to deny self, take up our cross, and overcome fear and overcome this world. Those two steps. John 21. I'm going to give you scripture. Just hang on. John 21, verse 14. He's getting his church ready. The church world, they ain't too sure because they listen to both sides. But the true church has an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and they discern it, and they receive it so they can walk in it. Verse 14, now I just read to you, they hiding out in the house. Now Jesus comes back the third time and appears and shows himself in verse 14 to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, you know Jonah, that's an interesting name. It's an it's Old Testament name, is it not? You remember Jonah, the evangelist? What did he do? He ran. When God told him to go to Nineveh, he went to Tarshish, and he went down. Every time he went, it was down. He went down to Tarshish. He went down to the boat. Then he went down to the bottom of the ocean, and then he went down in the well. Looks like he would understand. Every time I take a, a step, I'm going down. Something's wrong with this. Now Simon is, his daddy is Jonah. Do you reckon there's any connection? I don't have scriptural proof, but this really leapt off the page at me when I got this. Simon, son of Jonah, runner, do you love me more than these? Oh, that was an open opportunity for the old Simon to say, you know I, I love you more than all these. These are little, little sissies compared to me. <laughs> and he said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, if God has to ask you the same question two or three times, you're not getting it. Do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to the Lord the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. See, now, now he's getting a clue. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. For the third time, y'all, he tells him what to do. See, when people aren't really submitted to God, he'll have the preacher preach the same sermon over and over and over until somebody gets it. 21 years, submit. 21 years, submit. <laughs> we see, this is very interesting, from this account that the disciples have broken out of the fear. They're out of the room, aren't they? God, Jesus must have really ministered to them over fear, correct? They're out of the room, y'all. Coronavirus is behind them. They're not hunkered out in the bunker, are they? They're on the Sea of Tiberias. They're going fishing. What's wrong with this picture? That's where Jesus delivered them from. The sea, the boat, and fishing. Instead of being fishers of men, they back to being fishermen. In this story, that Jesus, it's in this story that Jesus is going to reveal to Simon, his disciples, and to us, the church, the very reason why they hid out in fear. You ready for it? And why they are doing something else other than obeying God's purpose and calling on their lives. Simon believed in his heart that he loved Jesus. There's a lot of Christians in a lot of church fellowships right now that believe they love Jesus. And they'll tell them, Oh, I love you, Lord. You know I love you more than these others. I'm Baptist. I love you more than the Methodists. I'm Pentecostal. I love you more than the Episcopals. 
I love you more. And he asked them again, do you love me? And they'll say, yes, Lord, I love you. But he'll look at them and say, your actions are not following your words. Therefore, your words have no power in your life. He believed that he loved Jesus. But Jesus showed him that he did not because he was not being obedient to the calling. Are you being obedient to the calling of God on your life? If not, then your words don't matter when you tell Jesus, oh, how I love you. But that's not the point, the main point of this message. The main point of this encounter between Jesus and Simon wasn't just about being obedient. But Jesus dealt with Simon's lack of love for Jesus. See, he made it look like he loved Jesus more than himself. He said, Lord Jesus, you will not go to the cross. I will go to prison and I will even die for you. That sounded like he really loved Jesus more than himself, does it not? And now he won't even obey Jesus. Simon and the other men loved themselves more than Jesus. And it was self-love that caused them to be paralyzed by fear. Self-love will make the church hide out when God's called us to go out and evangelize. Wow. Self-love will cause us to be disobedient to the Lord's calling on our lives. Now turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. It's all about to come together for you. You'll say, hmm. That makes sense. Verse 17. 1 John 4, 17. Y'all okay? Love has been perfected, made complete among us in this. So God is, is working in us diligently in these last days to perfect his love in us because we say we love him but we're not really obeying him and the reason we're not really obeying him is because we have not died to self yet but he has to get us ready and perfect us in love so that say that that we may have what boldness in the day of judgment are we seeing judgment oh lord we're seeing ju all judgment means is rendering a decision and then handing down the verdict. That we may have boldness, not fear, in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. The spirit of Christ is in us. We're created in the image of likeness of God. So we're like God in the earth. Are we not? There is no fear in love. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Do you know what John just did? No wonder Simon Peter wanted to slap John. He wrote that verse. There is no fear in love. Did Simon Peter tell Jesus there at the coast of Tiberias that he loved Jesus? But he's living in fear. So he really didn't have agape love. But perfect love does what? It casts out fear. But because fear involves torment. If you got fear, you're tormented. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Wow. Self-love, he's showing us our roots. Why we're not doing what he's called us to do. Why we're hiding out instead of evangelizing. Self-love will cause Christians to live in fear and to run from their calling. Like the disciples after Jesus' crucifixion. They were running. Jonah ran. However, when we allow God's love to be perfected in our hearts... By putting God's kingdom first. Now he's getting down there where the rubber hits the road and getting in y'all's business. He's been in my business. Now it's y'all's turn. They say you can tell a lot about a person's heart and who they love and what they love by looking at their bank account and how they expenditure their wealth. It says a lot about us. Who we put first. Amen or oh me? When we allow God's love to be perfected in our hearts by putting God's kingdom first, fear will be cast out of our hearts. So if we don't put God's kingdom first and God's will first in our lives, fear will grow in our hearts and thrive because we're not walking in perfected love. But when we put God's kingdom first, see, you could tell 
when David walked out on that battlefield in that valley, that he was putting God's kingdom first. You know why? He had boldness even in the day of judgment. Wow. See, judgment has a lot to do with punishment. If you're being judged, there's generally a good chance that same guy that's judging you is going to throw down the gavel and convict you. And if he finds evidence to convict you, he's going to punish you. See, we're living in the day of judgment, and there's that, that question mark in the back of our mind. Are we really, really right with God? And we try to justify that we're right with God because we go to church. And God says that ain't right with God. Right with God is walking by faith. And faith without works is dead. And so we won't have boldness in the day of judgment. But if we're putting God's kingdom first, we will have boldness. David had boldness. Now, in the springtime, when kings go out to battle, David stayed back. He didn't have that boldness then. He didn't have that drive, that fortitude, that perseverance, that character to want to go out to battle. And he sinned because he wasn't putting God's kingdom first. God is speaking very plainly to us by his spirit today, is he not? Simply by putting God and his will before our own desires, his spirit will empower us to overcome fear. Somebody needs to get this CD or go online and listen to this a hundred million times till you get this in your spirit and get the fear out. The fear that keeps you from obeying God. I have fear. My sisters know I have fear. But I don't let fear stop me from doing God's will. Never have. You know why? I put him first. I'm nothing without him. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But that won't come me hiding out. That comes me obeying God. Not in the front where all these lights are shining. In the house when nobody sees it. His spirit will empower us to overcome fear. And he will give us courage to face the enemies that oppose us. Now we're getting somewhere, y'all. God needs some men and women that will stand up to these giants in the land and have courage and boldness to face off with them. There is no power. There is no evil. There is no authority that is greater than God's love. None. Before the body of Christ can fulfill God's plan in the earth and hasten the return of Christ for the church, we have to learn how to love God more than self, more than life itself. Amen? Amen. Now we're getting somewhere. We've got to love God more than we love us. And when we do, God will empower us to take the land. Ephesians 6, and we're done. Is this empowering you? Self will make you hide out and be scared. Submission to God will allow you to have victory over self and you'll walk in courage. Ephesians 6.10. Then you can go home. Finally, my brethren, be strong. Be strong how? In the flesh? No. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It's not by might nor by power. It's by His Spirit. So be strong, Lord, walk in the power of his might and put on the whole armor of God that you may see. It's not about self-defense. It's about trusting in God to clothe you with his armor that you may be able to what? Stand against the wiles or the methodologies of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in, wick, and wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. That means resist the evil in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Stand. That's what God's been telling us to do. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. But he wants us to stand. After Jesus addressed the lack of love that Simon had for the Lord, you never, ever read where he and the other ten disciples Deny Jesus again. Ever refuse to obey God's calling again. See, when Jesus nails you on self-love, 
You will have victory from self. You will have victory over fear. And you will walk in your calling victoriously. They all decided to submit to God, put his will before their own will. In fact, his will before their own lives. Most of them were martyrs. And God empowered them with his love to live for him. The greatest power in all of creation is agape, God's love. That's the greatest power, y'all. When we allow God to perfect us in his love, the church will absolutely overcome Satan and this world and usher in the kingdom of God. See, it's all coming together. See, you endured to the end of the sermon so you could get the bang. You just got the, the mystery. When we die to self, we overcome fear. When we overcome fear, we will put God first. We will do God's will. We will spoil the kingdoms of darkness, and we'll usher in God's kingdom. I thought God's kingdom was already here. Then why did Jesus say, thy kingdom? See, the Lord ain't here yet. But when he come, he coming with his kingdom. And when his kingdom come, the lion and the cat, they lay together. And the cat won't get eaten by the lion. The child can play with the snake, and the snake won't bite him. Because God's kingdom is here. See, as long as we walk in the authority, we walk in God's kingdom here. We're ambassadors here. We have diplomatic immunity here. But if you're walking in the flesh, you can forget diplomatic immunity. He that dwelleth in the secret place shall abide under diplomatic immunity. <laughs> Break it down there where we can get it. He said, son of man. I had y'all repeat that, remember? Jesus was a man who was sold out to his father and loved God more than his own life, correct? Now, because he loved God more than his own life, he obeyed God to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And because he obeyed God, he overcame death, hell, and the grave. He spoiled the kingdoms of darkness, and he gave the church the victory. Amen? Amen. Therefore, God gave Jesus... The power to take on. Now get this. He was just a man. The average height and weight and stature of a Middle Eastern man. But God gave him the victory and the ability to take on the entire sin of the world. Every person ever born from Adam till the last day. Under that immense pressure and weight. It's pressure that is killing people's uh, encouragement and hope right now pressure intense pressure because of the fear of being threatened by Jezebel he had that weight on him y'all Jesus suffered at the hands of some of the very sinners that he was laying his life down to save how's that a fine how do you do they're literally nailing him to the cross and he's dying for them They did us a favor. But they're the ones that will stand in the wrath of God if they did not receive him as Savior and Lord. They were crucifying him to fulfill God's plan for salvation to be released. Get that, y'all. Under that weight, being crucified by evil men, sinners, laying down his life for them, and as Jesus was being betrayed, being lied on, falsely accused to death by a mock trial, hung on a criminal's cross, and they did all of this, this stuff, worked all of this up, dreamed it all up, and carried out their demonic agenda to make, by the appearance of a trial, by the appearance of false witnesses that came forth to testify that he had done wrong and evil and was uh, justly To be uh, crucified on a cross. They gave that appearance. That he was worthy of death. And after all this was done against him. And after he had taken on the sin of the world. What did Jesus do with the last few breaths he had? Father forgive them. 
for they do not know what they are doing. Now that was Jesus, y'all, as man. Say, I, I don't know why you keep saying that. At what point did he stop being God? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as a man, he died. The last Adam. It was the love. The love. The love of God gave him the power to take on the sin of the world, to face all the lies, all of the stuff, the mob saying, crucify him, away with him, give us a robber. He's worse than a thief. And yet, he stood up to it. He didn't back down. He didn't say, y'all ain't worthy of this. I'm going to call on the Father, and he's going to send 12 legions of angels to deliver me out of y'all's hands. Y'all ain't worth it. No. Love made him stand up under all that pressure. Love never fails. Now it's coming together. You ready for it? Go read 1 Corinthians 13 when you get home. But Revelation 12, 7 through 10. And there was a war in heaven between Michael and the archangels and Satan, the dragon, and his angels. And Michael and the angels fought with the dragon and his angels. And the dragon and his angels were cast out. And there was no place for them in heaven any longer. And they came down and wrath was poured out. And the church overcame Satan and his demons by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and loving not their lives to the death. That's the only way the church is going to overcome Satan, his demons, and that's the only way Michael, and his, uh, Michael the archangel and his angels are going to be able to overpower Satan and his angels is because the church on earth loves not our lives to the death. But once that happens, the church, the church, y'all, loves their lives not to the death, and they're willing. Didn't say they had to. They were willing to die for Christ's sake. Then... Victory is going to come in heaven, and then God's going to take us out because we will have overcome. So it wasn't about pulling out swords and fighting Russia and China and Iraq and Iran. It's about putting our swords away and loving Russians, Chinese. If you cannot love your brother whom you have seen, how can you say that you love the Father whom you have not seen whenever your brother is created in the image and likeness of God? Love will overcome. Wow. Isn't this awesome? God's good. Give him praise. Stand to your feet. Father, thank you so much. I give you all glory, honor, and praise.